This address by John Hilton was given at BYU's Campus Education Week on August 17, 2009. Hello, my name is John Hilton III and welcome to BYU Education Week. Have you ever been walking around in a public place and seen a sign that just made no sense? Like this sign. <laughs> when you read, touching wires causes instant death, $200 fine, you kind of wonder, which is worse? <laughs> or how about this sign, please be safe. Do not stand, sit, climb, or lean on zoo fences. If you fall, animals could eat you, and that might make them sick. <laughs> Sometimes if you see a sign like this, you might ask yourself, why? Why is this sign here? And perhaps sometimes that happens with the commandments. When we hear of a standard or a teaching of the gospel, sometimes there's a temptation to ask, why? Why can't I study date in high school? Why does the media I watch or participate in have such an impact in my life? Why does it matter if I tattoo my body? Unlike these signs, which seem to have, in some cases, no good reason, the commandments we have always have a reason. I love this quote from Elder Glenn L. Pace. He said, I've always been one that wants to know why. On the wall of our kitchen is a picture of a hen talking to her chicks with the caption, because I'm the mommy, that's why. However, we have been given good, logical, and spiritual reasons for the vast majority of things we are asked or commanded to do. When it comes to the commandments, there are great reasons why we have them. And today, our purpose is to talk about some of the doctrinal reasons why for the commandments that we have. Sometimes, perhaps, when we're confronted with someone who says, well, why do you live this commandment? Why does your church believe this? We say, well, that's just because of what the prophet said, or that's what my mom said. And those are good responses. However, there are more. Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve explained one of the reasons why it's so important that we know the why. He said, it concerns me as I see young people in our church who know all the correct things they should do and do not have a clue as to why. Do we understand why? Now notice this next phrase, if we do not understand the why, then the power available to us through the doctrine of Christ will not be evident in our lives. Let's consider a scriptural example of how understanding the why could bring power into one's lives. In Moses chapter five, we read of an account of Adam offering sacrifice to the Lord. This is Moses chapter 5, starting in verse 5. And he gave unto them commandments that they should worship the Lord their God and should offer the firstlings of their flocks for an offering unto the Lord. And Adam was obedient unto the commandments of the Lord. And after many days, an angel of the Lord appeared unto Adam, saying, Why dost thou offer sacrifices unto the Lord? And Adam said unto him, I know not, save the Lord commanded me. Now think about that. For many days, Adam was obedient to the commandments, even though he didn't know the reason why. Verse 7, And then the angel spake, saying, This thing is a similitude of the sacrifice of the only begotten of the Father, which is full of grace and truth. Once Adam knew that this sacrifice he was doing was representative of Jesus Christ, can you see how the next time he sacrificed, it was probably a more powerful experience for him? Before, although he was obedient, he didn't know why. But now that he knew the why, when he understood that a sacrifice would represent Jesus Christ, it became much more meaningful. Similarly for us in our lives, when we understand the why behind the commandments, there's a power that becomes more and more available to us. So let's start out by talking about, in general, why should I keep the commandments? Doctrine and Covenants section 82 gives us a great key. We learn a synonym for the word commandments in, this, in these verses. Doctrine and Covenants section 82, starting in verse 8. And again, I say unto you, I give unto you a new commandment, that you may understand my will concerning you. Or in other words, I give unto you directions. 
So commandments and directions are equated with each other. And sometimes we think, oh, what a restrictive commandment. Maybe we're talking about someone says, why can't we date till we're 16? You know, do we think that the church leaders are standing around somewhere and they're like, hmm, what can we do that's really going to bug the youth of the church? Ooh, I've got an idea. How about no dating till 16? Oh, yeah, put that in the pamphlet. <laughs> no, the Lord says I give you commandments or in other words, direction. The commandments are to guide us and to help us do things that will lead us to Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of a story a friend of mine told. This friend was a tough military guy. And he was really worried about what would happen when he had children, especially daughters, and when guys would try to date his daughters. So this was his plan he told me about. He said, you know how when you walk into some houses they have a little stand for umbrellas? Well, in my house I'm going to have a stand with baseball bats. And I'll have a bat for each of my daughter. And on the bat it will be my daughter's name and then I'll list all of the dating rules. So when a young man comes to date my daughter, I'll give him the bat and he'll have to read all the rules and then sign his name on the bat acknowledging that he has read and understands our dating rules. Then I'll take the bat and say, son, if you break the rules, the rules will break you. <laughs> what a profound statement that is. If you break the rules, the rules will break you. One reason why the Lord gives us commandments is because the commandments provide us with direction in our lives. They help us know the things that we need to do. I've had a personal experience with this. Once while I was at a zoo, I saw one of those signs that seems a little unusual. It said, don't stand too close to the giraffes. But they allowed you to feed the giraffes. You could pay a dollar and get some lettuce. And as you could hand the giraffe some lettuce, he would just reach out his tongue and slurp it up. And it was really fun. And I liked my giraffe so much, I wanted to have a picture with the giraffe. So even though the sign said not to, I, I stood by the giraffe. And just as they were getting ready to take the picture, the giraffe kind of looked at me and went like this whack and smacked me in the head. If you think giraffes are nice loving creatures, you're wrong. I had a bump for weeks. So in the final picture I decided to keep my distance from the giraffe. There was a sign and it was put in place to give me direction. It wasn't to impede my freedom and it wasn't to hurt me. Power comes into our lives when we keep the commandments. Let's take another look at a reason why we should keep the commandments by examining a scripture chain. Let's start in Doctrine and Covenants section 93. We often hear of the light of Christ and how the light of Christ helps us to choose and discern between good and evil. Doctrine and Covenants section 93 verse 28 gives us a key as to how we can have the light of Christ in our lives. Verse 28, he that keepeth his commandments receiveth truth and light until he is glorified in truth and knoweth all things. So why should I keep the commandments? Because as I keep the commandments, I receive light from the Lord. Now let's turn to Doctrine and Covenants section 50 verse 24 and see how this verse adds to section 93 verse 28. That which is of God is light and he that receiveth light and continueth in God receiveth more light and that light groweth brighter and brighter until the perfect day. So as I keep the commandment, I receive light. And as I receive light and continue to keep the commandments, I receive more light. And the more light I receive, the easier it is to discern between good and evil. So it kind of creates an upward spiral of light in my life. The more I obey, the more light I receive. The more light I receive, the easier it is to obey. The more I continue to obey, the more additional light I will receive. Another reason why it's so important to keep the commandments is simply because as we keep the commandments, we are happy. I love this quote from the prophet Joseph Smith. He said, God never has, he never will institute an ordinance or give a commandment to his people that is not calculated in its nature to promote that happiness which he has designed and which will not end in the greatest amount of good and glory to those who would become the recipients of his law and ordinances. So you don't need to figure out a complicated formula. It's simple. If we keep the commandments, we're happy. 
as we have righteous motives. And if we don't keep the commandments, well, we've already been taught wickedness never was happiness. Perhaps a graphic illustration of this is found in this series of photos. There was a picture taken of a drug user every year, and you can just see looking in her eyes and her countenance as time goes on in a life not living the commandments, how increasingly she becomes less and less and less happy. In our lives, the same thing is true. If we break the commandments, we do not receive happiness. But when we keep the commandments, happiness flows. So to summarize, why is it so important to keep the commandments? We've talked about three reasons. Number one, commandments give us guidance and direction. Number two, keeping the commandments can give us light and truth. And third, keeping the commandments helps us to be happy. So with any commandment, these principles will apply. Let's turn now and talk about some commandments, perhaps a little bit more specifically. And maybe we can start with the media. Why can't I listen to and watch whatever I want, some people say. This is an increasingly important question for us in the world in which we live. In August of 2001, President Henry B. Eyring gave a remarkable prophecy. He said that LDS youth cannot just go with the flow anymore and expect to remain righteous. He then prophesied of what is to come in the future. He said the flow has become a flood and soon will be a torrent. It will be a torrent of sounds and sights and sensations which invite temptation and offend the Spirit of God. Just two months after President Eyring's address, on October 23, 2001, the first iPod was introduced to the general public. Two years later, the first video iPod was introduced, and today, even older iPods can hold over 20,000 songs and 100 hours of video. And you can see that it's not just the iPod, but all sorts of cultural phenomenon like YouTube, Google Images, MySpace, Facebook. There are so many ways that we are inundated with the media. So if there's ever a generation that needs to be able to answer the question, why does what I watch or listen to matter so much? It's the generation of today. We can see one clear chain of events that helps us understand why what we watch and listen to is so important. Whatever we see or hear will affect what we think. What we think will affect what we desire. What we desire will affect our actions. The sum of our actions will equal our character, and what we become, our character, will, will determine our eternal destiny. It all begins with what we think, and what we think is so very much influenced by what we see and hear. In Jacob chapter 2, verse 5, Prophet Jacob says, I can tell you concerning your thoughts how that you are beginning to labor in sin. Have you ever had an experience where you watched a movie and had a dream that was similar to the movie you watched? Or have you had experiences where after watching a certain movie you were frightened because it was a scary movie and you were jumping around no matter what happened to you? What we see, no doubt, affects us. And if I were just to throw out, for example, a few lines from songs, don't shout them out, but just think to yourself, could you finish the blank? I still haven't found what I'm, I know you could do it. How about this one? Everything I do, I do it. Even those little songs are old. I know in your mind you think, oh yeah, I know that, because it's a tune you've heard over and over, and it's affected your thoughts, and it becomes a part of us. This is one reason why what we see and hear matters so much. In fact, the For Strength of Youth pamphlet plainly tells us Whatever you read, listen to, or look at has an effect on you. Therefore, choose only entertainment and media that uplift you. Good entertainment will help you to have good thoughts and make righteous choices. I heard of an interesting academic study that focused on this fact that what we see affects us. This study was done in part by Randall Wright and involved not only members of the church. This is a study of teenagers of all religions and those of no religion at all 
across several different states, a large teenage population sample. What they did was they noted how many R-rated movies these teenagers had watched in the past two years, and also their willingness to have premarital sex. And as you can see, the more times a person had viewed an R-rated movie, the more likely they were to have premarital sex. Now clearly this is a correlation and not causation, but still it's an interesting correlation that those who watched more and more depictions of on-screen sex and violence were themselves more likely to participate and engage in premarital sex. The idea that what we watch affects us is true and it is powerful. Now for a second reason why the media we watch is so important, let's take a look at this visual. What do you see as you look at it? Sometimes people just see a series of dots, but if you look carefully, you should be able to see a Dalmatian. Can you see the Dalmatian in the photo? Its nose is it's kind of like it's sniffing at the ground. You can see the left ear. Now the real challenge, once you've been able to help yourself see the Dalmatian, is to look at the picture and try not to see the Dalmatian. For most people, once they've seen this image, it becomes impossible to look at the image and not see the Dalmatian. And the message of this for us is that media is very hard to unsee or unhear. Once you've seen something, it's difficult to get rid of it. For example, Modern Prophets have taught in the For Strength of Youth pamphlet, pornography is a poison that weakens your self-control, changes the way you see others, and causes you to lose the guidance of the Spirit, and can even affect your ability to have normal relationship with your future spouse. Pornography becomes something once seen that's hard to unsee, hard to get it out of our minds. Lest we become discouraged, I love the quote that the scriptures are the best washing machine for our thoughts. So if we've been accidentally exposed to things that are wrong, we can pray to have those thoughts out of our minds. We can seriously study the scriptures. But know that one of the reasons why it's so important not to watch or listen to inappropriate media is it's hard to stop seeing it the flashbacks in your mind. This quote also highlights a third reason, and that is that the media can skew our perspective. It changes the way you see others. And this skew of the view can have a very negative impact in our lives. I remember myself as a teenager, there was a certain television show that I began watching, and after watching it for a few weeks, I noticed that my view of the world was changing. The television show was about wealthy teenagers and the parties they had, and I started to wonder to myself, how come I don't drive a nicer car? How come I don't have a hot tub? And I started to see that my way of thinking about things was changed by the media that I was watching. And I'm glad I recognized that and decided to stop watching that show, because the media we watch will change our view. So to sum up, as far as media goes, why does it matter what I listen to or watch? So we've discussed media affects our actions. It can be hard to unsee or to unhear. And media can skew our perspective in inappropriate ways. Let's take a look at another commandment. Why should I fast? Now I know that there are many people listening right now who fast diligently. But if someone were to come up to you and say, well, why do you fast? What would you say? Do you have a good reason? Are there doctrinal reasons for fasting that you know of? Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 58. This is my favorite chapter on fasting. And we learn several reasons from Isaiah why the fast is so important. Now, apparently, some of the people in Isaiah's time were fasting in a way that might sound familiar to you. Have any of you ever gone downstairs, poured that big bowl of cereal, crackling in the milk, and as you reach in that first bite, your mom yells, hey, it's fast Sunday. Oh. And you say, well, do I have to fast? Why? And it seems like some people were doing that in Isaiah's day. 
Look in chapter 58, verse 5. The Lord is speaking. He says, Is it such a fast that I have chosen, a day for man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloshes and ashes under him? Have you seen people like that? They kind of walk around. My soul is so afflicted. I'm so hungry. And then I love the question. He asks, wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? If I'm moaning because it's so hard to fast, is that acceptable? And then he goes on to teach us some powerful reasons about fasting. Verse 6, is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Let's just stop right there in verse 6. Is not this the fast I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness? We'll talk, for example, about fast offerings, and I think that's a common reason that people would think of for why we fast. But notice that the first reason Isaiah mentions is to loose the bands of wickedness. Fasting helps us keep the commandments for at least two reasons. Number one, as we fast, a very appropriate thing to fast for is for the strength to overcome temptations that we have. But second, one of the major causes of sin is a lack of self-control. In fasting, helps us gain that self-control. Let's look at how. If we can control our natural desire to sustain ourselves through food, we can better account for our natural desire for selfishness. If we can pass on a glass of orange juice in the morning, we will have greater ability to pass on a drink of alcohol at night. If we have the willpower to abstain from pre-mealtime food, we will have increased power to abstain from premarital sex. If we have the strength to turn away from a steamy meal, we will have the strength to turn off a steamy show. If we have the self-control not to touch the cookies that will ruin our fast, we will have the control to not touch the unclean thing that will ruin our soul. There's a power that comes as we fast to loose the bands of wickedness. Let's keep going in Isaiah chapter 58. Verse 7, is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Clearly, a, a powerful reason to fast is to help those in need. When we voluntarily fast once a month for 24 hours, we understand a little bit more about those who involuntarily fast continuously because they don't have enough to eat. The prophet Joseph Smith said, let this be an example to all the saints and there will never be any lack for bread. When the poor are starving, let those who have fast one day and give what they otherwise would have eaten to the bishops for the poor and everyone will abound for a long time. And so long as the saints will all live to this principle with glad hearts and cheerful countenances, they will always have an abundance. Think of what the world would be like if even the wealthiest 20% of the population fasted once a month and generously gave a fast offering. Hunger throughout the world could be eliminated. And there still is hunger throughout the world. This map depicts the percentage of population in individual countries of those living on less than one dollar a day. And as you can see, there are still sizable portions of the globe where half the population in those countries live on less than one dollar a day. Does our fasting and contributing fast offerings help them? It absolutely does. Now, not to surprise any of the young people here, but I would ask the question, at what age is it appropriate to begin paying fast offerings. For me, I had never thought about paying fast offerings until I entered the mission field. And as I was reading the missionary guidebook, one of the suggestions it said was, on, Sunday, on fast Sundays you should fast and pay fast offering. But no one had ever told me to fast before. I just assumed that because I lived at home, my parents paid fast offerings that I didn't need to pay fast offerings. However, when I went back and read the First Strength of Youth pamphlet, under fasting, 
it says you should pay a fast offering, that fast offerings are part of the true fast. So one invitation I would make to those listening today is, if you're not currently paying fast offerings with your fast, will you do so? And find that blessings come not only to others, but also to yourself. Let's just continue to see what one more of these blessings is in Isaiah chapter 58. Continuing with verse 8. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy re-reward. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Have you heard people talk about how they fasted for something, and it happened? Notice that phrase in verse 9. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. When we fast, it sends a signal to the Lord that we passionately care about the thing we are praying for. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. I testify to you that as we fast and pay a generous fast offering, the Lord will hear and answer our prayer. You recall the account in the New Testament when the Savior's disciples couldn't heal a man. And when they brought the man to the Savior, he said, This kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. There are challenges and difficulties in our lives that perhaps prayer by itself will not be enough. But as we fast, as we pray, as we diligently seek the Lord, he has said, I will say, here I am. So why should I fast? We talked about three reasons. Fasting helps us to overcome our sins, helps us to receive answers to our prayers, and fasting can help us to provide for the poor and also provide for them. Let's talk about another question. Why is it so important to stay morally clean? This is a question that comes up frequently. And we often are taught about the law of chastity, but some people may wonder, why? Why is the law of chastity such a big deal? There are lots of reasons. Perhaps I can just share a little experience with one. When I was in high school, my best friend Peter and I made a movie. We called the movie John and Pete's Search for Happiness. And the whole movie was about our search for happiness. We tried to find happiness in lots of different ways. We got jobs. We hung out with the popular crowd. We even tried out for the girls' gymnastics team. We didn't make it. But at the end of the movie, we finally found the true meaning of happiness. And you can probably guess what that was. It was by meeting some lovely ladies. And it seems like there's lots of movies that have their happy ending with a man and a woman coming together. But you know, with God's plan of happiness, it's the same way. God's plan of happiness is for a man and a woman to make sacred covenants with each other and with the Lord in the temple, to be sealed for time and all eternity. And the law of chastity is vital to the Lord's plan of happiness. Let's look at some specific reasons why. Elder Jeffrey R. Hall into the Quorum of the Twelve taught, We declare that one who uses the God-given body of another without divine sanction abuses the very soul of that individual. In exploiting the body of another, which means exploiting his or her soul, one desecrates the atonement of Christ, which saved that soul and which makes possible the gift of eternal life. Perhaps we don't stop to ponder and think that when one breaks the law of chastity, as Elder Holland says, it desecrates the atonement of Christ. It abuses the very soul of the individual, not just our own, but with the person we're breaking the law of chastity with. A second and related reason for why it's so important to live the law of chastity is found in twin scriptures in 1 Corinthians. Let's look first at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verses 16 and 17, the Apostle Paul says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. You've heard the phrase, my body is a temple and you don't have a recommend. <laughs> well, that's a true sentiment. Our bodies are temples. They're sacred and they belong to the Lord. In fact, 
as you know, the Corinthians is a series of letters back and forth between Paul and the people of Corinth. And sometimes I kind of think that the people in Corinth, the Corinthians, wrote a letter to Paul and maybe said something like, you know, Paul, it's my body. I can do with it whatever I want. Take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. I love just this first word. So someone writes to Paul, it's my body. I can do whatever I want. And Paul says, what? It's like he can't believe it. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And when we read that phrase, for ye are bought with a price, we might wonder, well, what is that price? It's the atonement of Jesus Christ. That's why our bodies are not our own. When we break the law of chastity, we desecrate the atonement of Christ. And, as Paul says here, we're violating that temple of God, which doesn't belong to us. It belongs to him. A third reason why, we, why it's so important to live the law of chastity was explained by President Benson. He talked about reasons why people fell into immorality and said that one of the reasons why someone would make the choice to be immoral is because that person feels a lack of love in his or her life. So imagine with, with me, if you will, a young woman who's with a boy. And this young woman kind of feels a little bit of lack of love in her life. And the boy wants her to do some things with him physically that she doesn't feel comfortable with. But she really wants the boy to like her. So she does the things he wants her to do, even though she doesn't feel right about it. Does it work? Does the boy like her more? President Benson taught, do not be misled by Satan's lies. There is no lasting happiness in immorality. There is no joy to be found in breaking the law of chastity. Just the opposite is true. There may be momentary pleasure. For a time it may seem like everything is wonderful. But quickly the relationship will sour. Guilt and shame set in. We become fearful that our sins will be discovered. We must sneak and hide, lie and cheat. Love begins to die. Bitterness, jealousy, anger, and even hate begin to grow. All of these are the natural results of sin and transgression. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 39 for an account of one who understood why it was so important to live the law of chastity. This is the scriptural account of Joseph, Joseph who was sold into Egypt. In Genesis chapter 39, verse 7, we read that after Joseph had become a steward in Potiphar's house and had demonstrated his ability to be a good steward, came to pass that after these things that his master, Potiphar's wife, cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. And I love the first three words of verse 8. But he refused. When temptation came, he refused. There are so many ways that that can happen today for you and me. Take a look at Genesis 39, 9. He said, there is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph understood that one of the reasons why we live the law of chastity is because it's a sin against God, and it's a serious sin. How can I do this great wickedness? Joseph said, this might be a good time to take a break from all the whys we've been discussing and talk for a moment about a what. What is the line of sin? Sometimes people wonder, well, how far can I go physically and not break the law of chastity? The For Strength of Youth pamphlet gives us a very clear answer. Quote, before marriage, do not do anything to arouse the powerful emotions that must be expressed only in marriage. Do not participate in passionate kissing, lie on top of another person, or touch the private sacred parts of another person's body, 
with or without clothing. Do not allow anyone to do that with you. Do not arouse those emotions in your own body. Do not participate in talk or activities that arouse sexual feelings. That is a very clear statement of principle. In fact, just that first sentence, before marriage, do not do anything to arouse the powerful emotions that must be expressed only in marriage. That is a clear standard. Do not participate in passionate kissing, lie on top of another person, or touch the private sacred parts of another person's body. That is another clear standard. But sometimes people want to be even more specific. Someone might say, well, it says do not participate in passionate kissing. What exactly is passionate kissing? I mean, how long can I kiss before it's passionate? <laughs> like 13.3 seconds? What's the cutoff? Or one time at a youth conference, a young man said, well, okay, it says you shouldn't lie on top of another person, but what if you're just at a 45 degree angle? What? <laughs> Does the For Strength of Youth pamphlet talk about angles? The principle is we want to stay as far away from the line of sin as we possibly can. And maybe I can share a story that will illustrate that. When my wife and I were coming home from a date, at the time we were actually engaged, and I wanted to impress her with my coolness. <laughs> so I was driving down the road, and I put the car in neutral and said I was going to coast the rest of the way to her house. So I turned down her street, driving along, maybe going 30 miles an hour, pulled into her parking lot, pulled into the parking stall, and I put on the brake, but nothing happened. I was slamming on the brake, but nothing. Hopped the curb and smack right into the wall of her apartment complex. <laughs> and then I came to a complete stop. <laughs> and I was stunned what had happened. And I realized that because I'd been so busy looking cool and I'd put my foot up on the seat, I had misgaged where the brake pedal was and I'd been pushing on the wrong pedal. So if you had told me at any part while we were coasting, hey, whoa, look out, you're, you're going to crash, I would be like, what are you talking about? I can stop any time I want. But in the key moment when I really needed to stop, I made a simple mistake, and that's all it took to smash my car into the wall. Similarly, in our lives, we may think, oh, I can stop any time. I've got it under control. But a few small mistakes, and that's all it takes to smash our lives into the wall of immorality. Why is it so important to live the law of chastity? It's so important because it's vital to the plan of happiness. And the standard is clear. So our goal and our question shouldn't be how long can I kiss before it's passionate, but rather how can I set a standard for myself to keep from ever getting close to the line of sin? And one invitation that I would give you is to find a time when you have some peace and quiet and you can deeply reflect and pray. Ask Heavenly Father to give you guidance on a standard that you could set for yourself to make sure that you never even come close to the line of sin. So if the line of sin is do not participate in passionate kissing, you could pray and set a personal standard like, between now and the time I graduate from high school, I will not and set something firm that you will never deviate from. We've talked about several reasons why it's so important to live the law of chastity. Because breaking the law of chastity makes a mockery of the Savior's atonement. Because the body is sacred. Because immorality leads to hate and not love. I pray that you and I will understand why it's so important to live the law of chastity so that we will have the power in our lives to live that law. Let's talk about another question that's frequently asked. Why should I dress modestly? My friend Anthony Sweat has what he calls the parable of the piranha. When he was uh, out in the Amazon River, he went fishing for piranhas. And he said it was a pretty nerve-wracking experience. Basically what you would do is you would cast some raw meat into the water and the piranhas would come for the meat, and then you just could grab them really easily. But you look at those sharp teeth of a piranha. They're pretty scary looking. So he was thinking about how interesting it was that the piranhas would be attracted to raw meat. But if you went up fishing, say, in the Utah mountains and used raw meat to catch salmon, it just wouldn't work. 
The kind of fish you could hope to catch is different depending on the bait that you use. And as you might have realized, there are some parallels for us in our lives with the parable of the piranha and modestly dressing. Turn to Doctrine and Covenants, section 88, verse 40. This verse teaches us a principle, same principle that's in the parable of the piranha, that the kind of bait we cast out will make a difference in the kind of, uh, in the kind of fish that we catch. Section 88, verse 40. For intelligence cleaveth unto intelligence. Wisdom receiveth wisdom. Truth embraceth truth. Virtue loveth virtue. Light cleaveth unto light. And we see there's a principle of like attracting like. The similar kinds of things are attracted to each other. Where it says here, intelligence cleaveth unto intelligence. If you're a very bright, smart person, would you want to hang out with someone who wasn't very bright? Maybe not. It says truth embraces truth. If you're an honest person, would you want to spend time with a liar? Probably not. And so what we cast out, so to speak, in large measure will reflect on what comes back to us. And so if you want to catch a nice, wholesome salmon, you're not going to throw raw meat into the river. Probably you've already thought and seen about how this relates to modesty. I remember an experience I had when teaching seminary and a young girl, probably a sophomore, raised her hand and she said, well, you know, I've noticed that unless I dress immodestly, boys don't pay attention to me. And one of the guys in class said, why would you want a guy like that to pay attention to you anyways? And it really just brought a light to my head to say, wow, that's right. Because that girl had picked up on the fact that there were some guys who noticed her when she dressed immodestly. But it, those were not the kind of guys she wanted to catch. Those were, in fact, piranha boys. <laughs> and you don't want to catch piranha boys. A related reason to why it's so important that we dress modestly has to do with how it can affect those who view us. Elder Dallin H. Oak said, Young woman, please understand that if you dress immodestly, you are magnifying this problem by becoming pornography to some of the men who see you. In 1 Corinthians, Paul was talking to the Corinthians about eating meat. And the question was, is it okay to eat meat that's been offered to idols? And as Paul responds to them, he says, basically, it doesn't matter. If you want to eat meat that's been offered to idols, it's fine. If you don't want to eat it, it's fine. But then in verse 9, he says, But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. And we can relate that to modesty simply by saying that although every person is in charge of his or her own wardrobe, what we wear may become a stumbling block to a weak sister or brother. And so as we have charity in our hearts for others, we'll want to dress modestly so as not to become a stumbling block for them. A Christian author named Joshua Harris captured this sentiment so profoundly for me. He's writing, talking to, to young women and says, you may not realize this, but we guys most commonly struggle with our eyes. I think many girls are innocently unaware of the difficulty a guy has in remaining pure when looking at a girl who is dressed immodestly. Now, I don't want to dictate your wardrobe, but honestly speaking, I would be blessed if girls considered more than fashion when shopping for clothes. Yes, guys are responsible for maintaining self-control, but you can help by refusing to wear clothing designed to attract attention to your body. I know many girls who would look great in shorter skirts or tighter blouses, and they know it, but they choose to dress modestly. They take the responsibility of guarding their brother's eyes. To these women and others like them, I'm grateful. Now, sometimes as we talk about modesty, we focus so much on the young women that some young men may think that modesty is not a principle that relates to them. This, however, is not the case. 
If you were to look at modesty in the dictionary, you'd find that definitions include being unassuming, humble, decent. And when we dress in such a way that it calls attention to ourselves, that becomes immodest. Elder Robert D. Hale said that modesty is at the core of our character and that it reflects who we are and what we want to be. We've frequently been taught the principle of non-distraction. For example, if someone's blessing the sacrament and that person has bright blue hair, it might be distracting as we look at the priest. It might make it harder for me to focus on the sacred ordinance of the sacrament because the priest's immodest hairstyle is distracting me from worship. So when it comes to things like saggy pants or extreme hairdos, modesty is a principle that applies both to young men and to young women. One final reason I want to bring up about why it's so important to dress modestly has to do that if we're dressing immodestly and showing off more of our body, we can become overly preoccupied with how our body looks. That can become a serious stumbling block to many. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland taught this fixation on the physical is spiritually destructive and accounts for much of the unhappiness women, including young women, face in the modern world. We have choices when it comes to what we wear. The scriptures speak of being clothed with purity, even a robe of righteousness clothed with salvation, power and authority, and above all things being clothed with the bond of charity. I hope that we'll make difficult choices if necessary and choose to be modest because we know why it's so important to dress modestly. Some of the reasons we've discussed, how we dress affects who we attract, whether positively or negatively. Again, beware of the piranha boys. Two, those who choose to dress immodestly may become living pornography and a source of temptation to some of those who see them. Third, dressing in a sloppy or worldly fashion sends the message that our character is sloppy and worldly and may distract others. Fourth, wearing revealing clothing causes us to become more self-conscious about our physical appearance. This can lead us to obsess over our appearance and become increasingly self-centered. Now, as we move to a conclusion, I want to address two points. The first point is, so what? Now that we've talked about these whys, what does it mean to me? And second, are there times in our life when we really don't need to know the reason why? Let's first talk about so what. So we've talked about why. What does that mean for you and for me? Maybe I could best illustrate this with an experience that happened on my mission. As you know, we believe in honoring, obeying, and sustaining the law, and that includes the speed limit. So one of the teachings of this church is that we believe in keeping the speed limit. One day on my mission, my companion and I were driving to Zone Conference, and we were late. But my companion was so righteous that he would not speed. Fortunately, I was driving. <laughs> so I was speeding, and he noticed, and he said, Elder Hilton, you're speeding. I know. Elder Hilton, speeding is against the law. I know. He then said, I have a testimony that you should not speed. I don't have that testimony. Well, a few minutes later, I saw lights flashing in the rearview mirror. And as I pulled off to the side of the road, my companion said, looks like somebody's going to get a testimony. <laughs> well, I got a ticket that day. But I didn't get a testimony, and the reason why is found in John chapter 7, verse 17 in the New Testament. The Savior said, if any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine. How do you gain a testimony of the principle of, a of a principle of the gospel? It's by living that principle. If any man will do his will, he will know the doctrine. So if you have a challenge with media, with fasting, with the law of chastity, with modesty, with keeping any of the commandments. If there's anything that we've talked about today, I would invite you, will you live that commandment? Will you live that law? And then you will gain a testimony of that principle. And as you understand the why and live it, the power of Christ will flow into your life even more fully. 
I do want to talk about, however, the fact that there are some times when we don't need to know the why. One of those has to do with why in times of trial. Sometimes if we're faced with a difficult circumstance, we might say, why me? Why does this have to happen to me now? But Elder Richard G. Scott explained this is not a good why question. He said, when you face adversity, you can be led to ask many questions. Some serve a useful purpose, others do not. To ask, why does this have to happen to me? Why do I have to suffer this now? What have I done to cause this? Will lead you into blind alleys. It really does no good to ask questions that reflect opposition to the will of God. Rather ask, what am I to do? What am I to learn from this experience? What am I to change? Who am I to help? How can I remember my many blessings in times of trial? When you pray with real conviction, please let me know thy will, and may thy will be done. You are in the strongest position to receive the maximum help from your Father in heaven. When you're faced with times of trial, don't ask why, why me? Another time it's not appropriate to ask why is with revelation. Oftentimes we receive a prompting from the Spirit that tells us to do something, but the Spirit doesn't tell us why. Like once when President Monson was a young man serving as a bishop, he felt a prompting to stop by at a less active couple's house. And as he stopped by and knocked on the door, the woman answered and said, Bishop Monson, so great to see you. How did you know that today was my birthday? Of course, President Monson didn't know, but the Lord did. And the Lord didn't spell out in every detail why President Monson should stop by that woman's house. He just gave a prompting and told him to go, and he did. When you and I are given promptings, we don't need to ask why, but we can just go and do. As we talked about in the beginning, Adam, for many days, offered sacrifice to the Lord, even though he didn't know the why. If you and I ever struggle with the why, we can continue to obey even though it's difficult. Today we've talked about many whys and times not to ask why. And as I mentioned just before, I would invite you to write down a goal, of a commandment that you could keep a little more fully. Will you write down something specific you could do? I promise you that if you do, you will be blessed. And you will feel the power of the Savior more more abundantly in your life. I want to testify to you that I know Jesus Christ lives. I am certain that he is a glorified, resurrected being. I know that he knows each one of us personally. He knows your name. He has said, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. And he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. The Savior wants us to know the reasons why. He has given us commandments to bless us. And if there's ever a commandment you struggle with, you can pray and seek help from Him. And I testify that the Savior will give you the strength to keep any commandment, to do anything that He asks you to do. I know He lives, and I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. For more information on this BYU Campus Education Week presentation, visit our website at byub.org. This address by John Hilton was given at BYU's Campus Education Week on August 17, 2009.